So, you guys all comfortable with me standing out in front here? Or you, you wanted to send me back behind the podium? Oh, okay. okay. Much okay. better in front than in back. Yeah. <laughs> I meant back that way. Oh. <laughs> Great. Uh, so, I'm Murray Carter. Most of you probably know that. And uh, I'm 42 years old. From the ages of 18 to 36, I was living in Japan, traveled there when I was 18. I, I was uh, expressly interested in, in picking up some karate skills when I was there. But more importantly, uh, you know, as, a, as a kind of a rebellious youth, Japan was geographically the furthest place on the globe away from my hometown of Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. <laughs> <coughs> and it worked because I stayed there for 18 years. <coughs> And I, had a, a, uh, I was really blessed to have a chance encounter with a man, Mr. Uh, Sakemoto, whose family had been bladesmithing for more than 400 years. He was the 16th generation Yoshimoto bladesmith. Of course, I didn't know that when I dropped in. I mean, that was just, that was all just providence. But uh, he befriended me, and uh, he allowed me to you know, come up kind of as a, to his shop, just as an interested, casual observer. And before long, I can't remember what day it was, but I was, you know, using his big rotating Japanese water stones and, and then working in his forge, and that led to a six-year apprenticeship, uh, at the end of which Mr. Sakimoto, having no sons but two younger daughters, uh, and, in a, and in a day and age in Japan, this would be in the, the uh, early 90s, uh, when most young Japanese uh, youth didn't want a job like a bladesmith or you know, an iron worker or a welder. Uh, you know, they, wanted, they wanted to get the jobs at Sony or Mitsubishi or something like that, where they were you know, having their lifelong employment and you know, have a good, easy uh, desk job. You know? Of course, the standard of education is pretty high in Japan, so easy for anyone who aspires to that kind of job to get it. So you know, without too many other uh, hopeful prospects on the horizon, Mr. Sakimoto, uh, he entrusted me with his business. So I'm now 17th generation Yoshimoto bladesmith. Uh, I state that I'm the only Caucasian to ever had the privilege to do something like that. And you know, in this day and age of the internet, it's still unchallenged. So I just, you know, I, I figured that's my research. You know, if no one, if no one challenges it, it's as good as gospel, right? Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, people on the internet, they'll challenge all sorts of things. Uh, anyone see my shaving with a spoon video? We got one guy back there. Only guy in the world shaved with a spoon. You guys haven't seen it yet? No. <laughs> okay. Well, all you go to YouTube and you look up shave and spoon. Just you type those in and it's the only one there. Anyway, so I, I forged a special spoon out of you know, Hitachi carbon steel and, and I you know, went through this, you know, Chuck Norris shaves with a chainsaw, but Murray Carter shaves with a spoon, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I shave with a spoon and can you imagine even people say, that's fake. <laughs> <laughs> you could hear every whisker, I had the you know, microphone on just like I do now, you could hear every whisker as it comes off, that's fake. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the funny thing about YouTube is everyone else calls out these guys on it. You know, like, what do you think he did? Glue those things to his face? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, this, the world's full of interesting people. So, uh, so I was in Japan for 18 years. And at 36, I, uh, I'd been coming to this show and many other shows uh, for you know, pretty much since about 1995, maybe 1996, and I had made lots of friends and enjoyed, uh, you know, what I perceived to be the the American lifestyle and the you know life of entrepreneurialism and 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 freedoms and so on. So I started investigating the possibilities of immigrating to the United States of America because I was a Canadian citizen. And uh, just to not bore you with all those details. It took 10 years, but in, on December 28th of last year, I became a U.S. citizen. So it was a long, drawn-out process, but I'm very happy. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I like you know, knife guns and God, so I hope I fit in. <laughs> right, right winger. Yeah, yeah, knives, yeah. Knives, yeah. guns, and God, they covered it. Yeah, <laughs> knives, guns, and God, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I really was blessed in Japan for 18 years, and I've made, now in a, my 24-year career of making knives, I've completed over 17,000 knives. And that's, you know, I do have uh, full-time help in my shop from one apprentice. Uh, he's in my book. Uh, 
He's been with me since he was 15 years old, and he's 23 and just bought his first house. Seamus, going to get married soon. And then I have Jason, who's my full-time administrative assistant, looking after computer stuff and telephone calls and, and, uh, and uh, you know, customer service. And so a little three-man operation, but ultimately every knife was forged, heat treated, ground, polished, and finished by me. So that's a lot of knives considering. Today, now that you kind of know who I am, and we'll have, my presentation isn't going to be very long, so we'll have plenty of time afterwards for question and answers, and you can ask any question you want about anything relevant to what we're talking about. Uh, today we're going to talk about the fundamental differences between Western cutlery and Eastern cutlery, specifically Japanese cutlery. They're kind of the, the, the industrial leaders in Asia anyway, so that's the perspective we're talking about. And I don't claim to have any expertise on any other knives outside of the, the Japanese realm anyway. So let me get my little memo pad, make sure I don't miss anything. Make sure we're opening this from the right direction. Yeah, so when I first came to these knife shows back in, you know, 1995, 1996, Blade Show in Atlanta, Georgia, that was my first knife show I ever attended. And every other knife show after that was a disappointment. <laughs> you never want the Blade Show to be your first knife show because it's, you know, it's pretty overwhelming. Of course, this, this knife show was a, was a nice fresh breath of fresh air after the Blade Show. Same scope, same size, same prestige. Uh, Dennis, you know, in case you heard that. <laughs> it's a great show. Best, actually, the best thing about the Oregon show is it's, is it's uh, you know, it's laid back and everyone's friendly and, you know, there's a, there's a comparing it to the Blade Show in Atlanta, if you've never been there, it's, it's a little more high strung. You know, there's a lot more wheeling and dealing and big business going on and you can feel there's a little bit of tension in the air because a lot of people are there to be tested for Master Smith rating or Journeyman Smith rating and you get guys, you know, who travel all the way over the world and they got already five or six thousand dollars into being there and they're a little nervous whether they're going to make that back at the show or not. It was a little, so they're more business oriented, you know, than here. And here's more just, it's kind of a celebration of cutlery. Well, when I first came to these shows, there wasn't a whole lot of awareness, by my observation, in Japanese cutlery. And uh, at the time, I think the only major manufacturer that was kind of dabbling in Japanese style knives was Henkel. I think they had a Japanese style Santoku in their lineup, which is kind of their, you know, your typical six inch, seven inch uh, kitchen knife. But, you know, basically, you know, if you walked around this show or the Blade Show back in 1995, you probably wouldn't have seen any other kitchen knives on anyone's table that they had made themselves. You'd see some guys peddling with, you know, secondhand carving sets or kitchen knives, but there wasn't a whole lot of interest in forging or making your own kitchen knives. And definitely, there, you wouldn't have, you would have been hard pressed to have found a laminated blade anywhere. You had Damascus, which is laminated, but you didn't have, you know, what we're typically referred to as a San Mai style construction where you got something soft on the outside of the blade and some kind of a hard cutting core in the inside. Um, I think there have been some knife makers before my time. I think Fred Morseth, was it Morseth? I don't know if his first name was Fred, but Mr. Morseth, I think he was a Scandinavian knife maker. I don't know if he's any, I don't know if he's still with us, but uh, he made laminated blades. But basically, they were pretty rare. And now, conversely, you know, you've got you know, the, the uh, Kershaw line of knives, the Shun knives, they're all laminated. You know, Cold Steel makes a lot of laminated knives. You, know, you don't have to look very far in this day and age to find a laminated knife or, or a Japanese style kitchen knife. They're pretty common. So I like to think that I had some part in popularizing that in the, in the Western market. When I first brought my knives over here, I was, I was a little uh, anxious as to whether, you know, how my knives would be received. And that's every new knife maker is anxious when he comes to a knife show with his knives because you don't know how the general public is going to receive you or what the feedback's going to be. It seems to me, and I'm open for your feedback, it seems to me that the main focus, the philosophical focus, is that you have a knife that cuts, that's sharp, but the focus is on being tough and durable. You know, a lot of, a lot of the cutting performance of a Western blade is compromised in the interest of being durable and tough. Not so much that it won't cut anymore. Obviously, people have been cutting with Western blades for 
decades, centuries. So, you know, it's not like it's no, n not useful anymore because all of its cutting performance has been compromised, but a large percent of its cutting performance is compromised in the interest of being tough and durable. Now, what is cutting performance? Well, let's just, let's just make it, uh, describe it as in as simple terms as possible. Hardness in a blade, or Rockwell hardness, HRC, is directly proportional to cutting performance. The harder a blade is, the finer an edge it can take and the longer it'll hold that edge, just in simplicity terms. So the more hardness you compromise in a blade, the tougher it'll be, but the less cutting performance it'll have. Is everyone with me so far? Okay, so you leave the blade harder and it'll cut better. It'll cut longer and it'll cut sharper. It's just that simple. It's just a matter of, I don't know, you call that physics or chemistry? I don't know, it's a matter of science. So, the philosophy of making Western knives is, is that it's gotta be durable. I remember, as a ch I was a teenager in a local sporting goods store in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and some customer had brought a buck knife in, and the edge had chipped out of it. And I remember everyone saying, oh no, this blade's got a chip in the edge. Like it was like, you know, the, the, the totally faulty, you know, it was, like the, it was like the worst thing that could have ever happened to this knife. Is everybody who saw this knife is like, they were just, in, they couldn't believe it, you know, especially because it had the Browning name on it, you know. And, and, I, and it just, that's the mentality. It's like if you get a chip in the edge of a knife in North America, you've got to be dealing with a real piece of junk, okay? Never mind the fact that if it's, you know, if it's hard enough to take a good keen edge and hold that keen edge, it is also hard enough to chip. But anyway, it seems that, it seems that you, you, there's a lot of imagery where you think of, you know, like the old Remington. Remember they used to paint the tin, the tin uh, advertisements? the old Remington or Winchester advertisements where there's a guy on a mountain and he, he's like this with his Bowie knife and there's a bear on top of him and, and he's got his lever action rifle beside him or something like this or, you know, one of those, what are those, that's kind of like a, it's kind of like a romantic image of the Wild West, right? Out there, lone man all by himself trying to, you know, strike it rich. And, you know, the idea that this knife has to be durable to withstand anything because it might be the only blade you have. And maybe that, you know, maybe that is a result of the, of the old gold rush days when the, all the men were heading west and they had one rifle, maybe one handgun, one knife and some, you know, a pickaxe and some supplies. And they, they really needed their knife to be more than anything durable. But there's a philosoph philosophical, it's a philosophical idea that permeates the whole process of making the knife. It influences the whole knife. Where conversely now, let's talk about, you know, Japanese knives. The philosophy is, is that the blade, first and foremost, has to cut, take a super keen edge, and hold that edge for as long as possible. In other words, the focus is on the performance and not on durability. So you're going to see that influence through all these now specific steps that we talk about. Um, another fundamental difference might be the uh, design. In, you know, in current, you know, Westerners are, tend to be, if, if, you, if you were to uh, typify your your, your average Western male against a Japanese male, you might say that the Westerner would be uh, uh, logical and, uh, you know, kind of more, more dominated by a logical approach to life, and maybe the Japanese might be more emotional. So emotions versus logic. And that shines through when, you know, a company is going to... Uh, do a run of knives, you know, the Western, the Western company is going to plan and calculate and, uh, you know, go through all the, uh, you know, the, 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 the expenses and costs and, and profit before they even make the knife. They're going to, you know, it's going to be a well-planned well well design. And so, sometimes when Western cutlery companies are designing a knife, they're going to consider things like ease of manufacture. Okay, well, if we do it this way, we have to use this machine, which is going to cost this much. But if we use this machine, which we're used to using, and it's, it's faster and, and, and uh, you know, it's easier to run, and the machine is easier to maintain and less, you know, less cost prohibitive, let's do it that way. So you can see right from the design point of view that, that some things can be decided on based on ease of manufacture. And 
Now I'm gonna, and I'm gonna uh, juxtapose that with not you know, cheaply made Japanese knives, but the finest ones you know, made by the best bladesmiths in Japan. Generally speaking, their, their point of view is when their design knife is, is, doesn't matter how difficult it is to make, we're gonna make it the time proven, time intensive, labor intensive, skill intensive way. So the other, the next thing that they'd come to would be the choice of steel. And I could just start by saying that, you know, the Japanese, for the finest knives, they're just going to say, okay, well, there's, there's, there's one choice to make the best knives in Japan. That's Hitachi white steel number one. I mean, there's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's the, it's the Lamborghini or the Bentley or the Rolls Royce of the cutlery world. I mean, it just has no competitors. It's the cleanest and it's high carbon steel and it has the, you know, the finest carbide dispersion and the smallest carbides and, and so on. So it's an easy choice. They just use the best. Use white steel, Hitachi white steel number one. Whereas when they're designing a Western style piece of cutlery, you know, they're going to use 440 or 154 you know, CM. They're going to use ATS 34. They're going to use you know, 440B. Are they going to use you know, 30V or you know, I don't even know all the different steel names. But what does it usually come down to? Availability and cost, right? Because they're thinking, well, this knife is geared for this market. It's going to be an eighty-dollar knife, so you know we can't use the you know most exotic steel. So, so, so usually, is this cost is going to be part of the decision making in there? Um, I don't know if I don't know if I've ever come across a Western Western knife where they said this is absolutely undisputed the best. We made this with the best steel in the world. We didn't care about cost, we just used the very best steel. In a factory run knife, I don't know if I've ever come across one. There, there probably are, there probably is one, but it's not common, right? When you say Western, do you include like Haeckel, the German? Yeah, 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 yeah. European, it's European, it's American, yeah. yeah. So yeah. they don't use Hitachi white steel when they make those knives. They use they, they in being Western people? Yeah, the, the, say, Haeckel doesn't, doesn't make a knife. Not to my knowledge. Yeah. Not to my knowledge. I mean, they could use probably, uh, you know, Swedish, some Swedish cutlery steel would probably come pretty close. You know, even, even uh, post-World War II, uh, before Hitachi could meet up with their, the demands, you know, beef their production up to meet demands, they actually imported some S Swedish carbon steel to use. And even uh, the company Misono in Seki City, Japan, still has a line of Swedish steel knives. Uh, Okay, next is going to be, now that we've selected the steel, the next is going to be, and this is a tremendously big difference, is grinding. Every knife's got to be ground, right? You know, most blades, fundamentally, they have, they have their original blade thickness, which you can see from the spine of the knife. Then they have some kind of a geometry where it starts to become V-shaped, and I call that the secondary edge. And then it has the, the part of the blade that, does, that initiates the cutting, which is the primary edge. So we got the blade thickness, secondary edge, and primerage. And all of that has to be ground off of a blade blank. Well, suffice to say that in North America, because it's more logical to grind metal while it's still soft, most of the shaping of a Western knife happens prior to heat treat. And typically, Japanese blades are left fully thick and then heat treated. So, that's a, that's a tremendous difference because what that means is then in the quenching process, if you have a blade with cross-section where it's thin on the edge and thick in the back, you're limited to what kind of quenching process where you heat the blade up to a critical temperature, orange looking, you know, in the dark, and cooling it rapidly. You can either cool it in air, you can cool it in oil, you can cool it in water, you can cool it in brine. Maybe there's some other things. People can use different salt baths to quench blades in. But a severe quench would be water or brine, and a very gentle quench would be heated oil or air. And the gentler the quench, the less warpage and the less distortion in the blade, but at a compromise of what? Rockwell hardness. And water or brine is the severest kind of quench. It, it brings out the full hardness of the steel, but usually is accompanied with a lot of warpage and, and, and bending and twisting, because it's a very severe quench. So if you've ground all your knives first, as is common in Western cutlery, then you, ha then you have to select 
a gentle quenching process or else all the blades are going to be warped and twisted and bent. And that brings us back to the philosophy. If you've got a board of directors who, are, who have approved this run of batch of knives of 1,000 knives, and they've already approved you know, the expenditure to purchase the steel and to, and to prep the equipment and so on, the you know, last thing they want to know is that there is some sort of risk that in the quenching process, more than half of these knives will be destroyed. Cracked, bent, twisted, the edges ribboned. That would never be acceptable in a Western business. So. They said, no, 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 we don't want that quenching medium. Listen, if, if, that, if this is borderline, then you bring it right back to here. We want to make sure all 999 out of those 1,000 blades are going to be marketable. Because it's just a logical thing. But so, they, so they, they're compromising in the process right there because they want to err on the side of safety you know, so that what they have is going to be marketable. Whereas you know, the, if, philosophically, you know, one bladesmith I know in Japan, you can see him on YouTube, if you look up Carter Cutlery, best Japanese bladesmith, uh, Mr. Shiraki, when, he, when he, he treats his blades, he just knows there's going to be a certain number of them that crack, blow up, destroy, bend, and twist beyond repair. But he plays the numbers. And he does so many of them that he can live with some of them being destroyed. But in doing so, he knows that every one he quenches is right there on the very threshold of maximum performance. When I forge weld 10 billets of steel, when I forge weld 10 little pieces of high carbon Hitachi white steel into the mild steel to forge them into kitchen knives, if I forged 10 of them and all 10 are perfectly forge welded, I've blown it. People say, oh, you got 10 perfect billets, what's wrong? I said, no, if one or two of them don't come out borderline welded where I got little, little black lines on them, if they're all perfectly forge welded, it means I forge weld them all a little too hot. I want one or two of them not to come out perfectly, so I know the other eight were right there on the threshold. And I don't vary, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm trying to forge weld them all at the same temperature, consciously, but if they're all perfectly forge welded, I was a little hot on all of them. Well, Make sense? What is the consequence of being too hot? Uh, you you, 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 you sacrifice a little bit of the final grain structure in the cutting performance of the blade. If you can, for, if you can successfully forge weld at the lowest possible temperature, you're coming up in temperature, and at any time, let's say you try to forge weld, well, here they just simply won't stick. And then there's a certain point where part of it will weld and part of it won't weld. Then there'll be a part where almost all of it welded, but there are faint lines in between the steel and mild steel. And then you got a perfect forge weld, and then from there on, you got a perfect forge weld. But with every degree higher, you're sacrificing the integrity of the steel. To at one point where you've tried to forge weld at such a high steel, a high temperature, that the steel cracks and sparkles and you, you burned it up like like burning an apple pie in an oven at 500 degrees for 10 hours. I mean, it just, you, you ruined it. But we're looking for, you know, perfectly forge welded, but only five degrees above the temperature where we're seeing faint lines. Does that make sense? So the Japanese bladesmith is trying to hit it right on that threshold every time, whereas Western style cutlery is like, is like no, no, I want an extra element of safety. Give me safety. Give me, make sure that these things are going to be marketable. So they would do it hotter than you would just to ensure that it's all... Well, that was an example of forge welding, but yeah. before that we were talking about quenching. Yeah, I understand. And quenching is the same thing, is that, is that you get to a certain degree and you, if you quench it, you'll start to get hardness, but not maximum. And then there's a point where you'll get maximum hardness at a temperature and quenching it. And then any degree above that, you still have maximum hardness, but you sacrifice the grain structure of the steel again. So uh, the more radically or the quickly you quench it, the... The, the, well, the hard, the, yeah, yeah, the harder you can get the blade. The harder you can get the blade yeah. up to a point, yeah. and then you start getting failures of the grain structure. That's right. Down. That's right. Do you use borax when you forge weld? Well, I use a special flux that ha contains borax. Okay. The flux that I use when I forge weld is is uh, it's a uh, Tachibana brand of uh, or Hibana brand, over made by a small company in Japan, and it's borax acid, borax, and iron filings. And I, I don't know what the exact proportion of those is. So since we, we were talking about you know, the quenching and that if you try to severely quench you know, in water or brine a blade that's pre-ground, you're going to end up with the edge ribboning because the thin steel in the edge will cool a lot faster than the thick spine will and so on. So that'd be unacceptable because the blade would, would warp or twist or bend. But the Japanese, they're quenching in water, but they're quenching fully thick and it still warps and twists. But the, here's where a big difference comes in. If, if you've got slightly bent or warped knives coming out of an American factory or a Western factory, 
they just leave them bent and warped. That was my biggest criticism of those <laughs> knives. Almost all of them, I think they're doing a little bit better now, but almost all of them, if you hold the tip, if you hold the tip towards your eyes like this and look towards the handle, you'll see almost all of them are bent to one side or the other and even twisted a little bit. And then they just sell them that way. You know, they don't have the consciousness that they should hire a, 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 a skilled craftsman to try to fix that a little bit. I mean, they just, if they're bent and twisted, they just, you know, as long as, as, long as you know, to most people, most people don't think to look for it, so they probably get very little, very few, you know, uh, quality claims, you know, get, you know, warranty claims. But now that I taught you guys, you can do that. You can look at them, and you'll see that most of them are bent or twisted. But conversely, because the Japanese bladesmiths expect their blades to warp and twist when they quench them in water, straightening the blades before they're, you know, completed and sold to a customer is, is just a natural part of the process of making a knife. When I make a knife, I sit down at my straightening sec uh, station, which is simply a stump with a brass hammer on it and another little stump to sit on in front of a, na a natural source of light, like that window. I'll sit down at that station seven times with the same knife between the time I start it and finish it. Okay, Because it's, you know, straightening a knife is just an important aspect, an part, important part of the process of making a, a, a Japanese-style knife. Could you describe how you straighten it? I mean, what the actual process is? Uh, we have to cover that another time. Okay. Yep. Now, lastly, so we had blade warpage. Lastly, would be the sharpening. You know, how is it? You know, what do they do at Henkel or at Gerber or what any of these companies? You know, after they got the knife, it's all polished up. Doesn't have a final edge on it. Doesn't have a final primary edge on it yet. What do they do between that? process and putting it in the box and selling it to you. The general machine grinder. Yeah. When there's a, some kind of a bench grinder and there's one guy who this is what he does all day. That goes and on the other side he steps over here to a buff and charges the buff with a little green compound. Goes, zh, zh. Yep, good to go. And that's how they put the final edge on a knife, right? And some do it better than others, you know. I remember even way back when I was when I was a kid, one of the first knives that cut me good and that I was really impressed with was a little Kershaw folder knife. And at the time, you know, those Kershaw knives were the sharpest out of the box, you know, a manufactured knife. But still, just done like that by machine. But now how about, you know, the, 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 the Japanese knives? You probably all know, you know, they, sh they, they sharpen and polish every one of those by hand. And it could take upwards of 20 or 30 minutes to put the primary edge, that cutting edge, that initiating cutting edge, on one of their knives that they sell. And, and that's why I do it too. I, 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 have, I put what I call a shop, a shop edge on all of my knives in the shop with a grinder or with my rotating water stones. And I, do, and I do buff it to make it shiny, but I would never in a million years or consciously sell it that way. The last thing I need to do when I sell the knife is, is put that final hone, razor sharp, scary sharp edge on it. Okay? So we've talked about different things. We've talked about choice of steel, costs. We've talked about in, you know, grinding before or after. We've talked about quenching mediums. We've talked about the uh, warpage and straightening. And now we've talked about how you put the final edge on, on a blade. Thank you, Jason. And, you know, it, isolated, each one of those things may not seem like a big difference. But the net effect of, of, of all of those different processes and how fundamentally they're done differently and, and the philosophical difference between the two, you can see the net result produces a tremendous difference in the overall quality and cutting performance of the blades. Now, I guess I forgot to mention, you know, typically the Japanese blades are going to be as thin as they can be for the job and no thicker, whereas Western blades are usually built and designed with the lowest common denominator in mind. They're, 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 they're thick enough for the guy who's the worst abuser of knives. And then, and then similarly, the, the geometries near the primary edge, the Western blades are going to be thick enough so that they'll never chip, so that some young guy like me at the sporting goods store, oh, that blade chipped, it's terrible. They're usually going to be too thick, you know, so that anyone can use them and they won't chip out. The Japanese blades are usually, conversely, too thin. What I mean by too thin is they'll make them super thin for the guy who's got the finest knife skills, and they'll let the blades chip out for the guy who's the bull in the china shop type with the understanding that that guy will go to his stones and sharpen out the chips 
and bring then the primary edge to the perfect edge geometry for his style of use. If you've got a, if you've got a blade and you're using it for something and, and, and it starts to damage, maybe it doesn't chip out. Maybe you can just start to see the edge ribbon a little bit to one side or the other and you catch that soon enough. And if you go to the stones and just grind your primary edge, which means you're gonna, the, the, the secondary edge is going to be slightly off the stones, and grind your primary edge to the point where you remove that damage from the edge, you now are at a perfect equilibrium point where you can now use that knife all day long for the same cutting task and the edge it will no longer have any damage to it. But it's as thin as possible as it can be. It's not thicker than it needs to be. You see, so, so, so it's an it's a, it's a equalizing or a stabilizing process from being too thin and you sharpen it back to the thickness you want rather than buying a knife that's too thick and now you gotta go and, and grind it down thin if you want good performance for it. Like if you guys all have western style knives at home, the single best thing you could do to increase the cutting performance of your blades is to thin down the, the, the secondary edge profile, grind it thin, which means all the metal behind the primary edge you could grind down thin. In fact, I bet, I, I hazard to guess that you could grind them to half the current thickness they are right now and still not notice any problems when you cut. You would just, all you would notice is an increased performance. And you wouldn't notice that the edges were failing on you. That's how thick, that's how overbuilt most Western knives are. So that concludes the technical presentation of the difference, the contrast between Western style knives and Eastern knives. Now I open up the floor for question and answers. So could you talk a little bit about the difference in shape? Not just the, and what the, what the functional purpose or end result of yeah. those shapes might be. I'm glad you asked that because, uh, again, philosophically, you will have this tendency in the uh, Western kitchen to pick up the favorite knife that you use all the time and indiscriminately cut everything with it. From the tomato slice to cutting your turkey to cutting a sandwich in half to peeling an apple. Use this. You, you guys probably can think of the one knife that you always pick up in your kitchen. When, when in reality, you have probably that 28-piece, you know, butcher block set of all the different knives, but you only ever use the same one. Uh, yeah, 28. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, by contrast, you know, the the average Japanese house will have a minimum of five different, fundamentally different style blades. They'll have a long slicer, a thick cleaver, uh, a small kind of petty knife, a, a square nakiri which is kind of a rectangular looking blade, and, and one that's shaped like this, but usually a little shorter. And, and they'll usually use those knives for different tasks. If you look in a Japanese cutlery catalog, you'll see literally hundreds of, of various styles and shapes of kitchen knives. At Carter Cutlery, we have taken some of the mystery out of that for you. We're working on a 10-part uh, instructional DVD series right now called Kitchen Cuts and part one was all about a paring knife, and part two was all about the Japanese nakiri, and right now we're editing and compiling part three, which is long slicing knives. And the idea is we take each different style of knife that you'll commonly run across, 10 different styles, and we show you 20 different ways how to use that knife. Not just, you know, cut a bell pepper, cut an onion, cut a carrot, no. What we're showing you is how to use the tip, how you can use the back of the blade, how you can use the flat of the blade, how you can use the belly of the blade, how you can use the heel of the blade, how you can use the handle of the blade. We go to, we've, we, we've researched some of the best restaurants in North America. We go and visit with their chefs. We say, hey, show me some, some tips and tricks of the trade that you've learned over your 20 years here in the, in the industry. Could you guys imagine that you can take a long slicing knife and take a strip of bacon and stretch it out to twice its original length still preserving the integrity of that slice of bacon so that you can wrap it around a steak to fry it. And those are the kind of things that we're, we're highlighting in these videos. Did you know that the Koreans, when they make kimchi, they slice their, their garlic and then they smash it up with the handle of their knife before they mix it in with their, with their Chinese cabbage. So these are the th little tricks of the trade that we're teaching in these videos. So we have, you know, the 20 different ways to use each type of knife. Then we have exclusive interview footage with these chefs. So like if you're interested in the industry and you know like a culinary school student wants to know what it takes to be successful in that industry, you know, we're, we're asking them these questions. You know, what advice would you give to new chefs? Then we have uh, exclusive forging footage where I make the knife that's on the cover of that video from start to finish in my forge so you can see how these knives can be created by a craftsman by hand. And then there's going to be 10 different projects, but I'm not making just 10 different shaped knives the same way, every way is different. I'm laminating one blade, I'm forging carbon steel in the other, I'm doing Damascus in the other, I'm uh, using pre-laminated stainless uh, Fukugozai steel. 
I'm making Japanese simple handles. I'm making you know, complex Western style handles. So you're going to see 10 different projects in these videos. And then lastly, we have sharpening and maintenance tips exclusive to that style of knife that, be, that go beyond just the general thin your secondary edge, thin your primary edge, hone your primary edge, and you're, you're ready to go. So that, that, so that series will answer that question. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, we actually have them on our table here. We have parts one and part two for sale. Yeah. Yeah. The Japanese, Yes. Yep. Their paring knives are usually going to be a little bit larger than a Western style, you know, three inch or four inch mm -hmm. paring knife. But they do use a paring knife and they don't they don't uh, they don't peel so many things in the same way as we do. But I'm thinking one thing that they, that they use that smaller knife for is, is when they're making miso soup, they'll put the whole block of tofu in their hands and they'll cut it square one way and then cut it square the other way. So they, they do do some things that are similar, you know, like to, to cutting against your, your, you know, using your own flesh as a stopper when they, you know, when they cut. Yeah. Uh, if you are straightening your knife after it's quenched, after it's hardened, how do you keep it from cracking? Yeah, great. The, uh, well, there are two different ways to straighten a blade. You, there's, there's a way to straighten all carbon steel or, or stainless steel, what we call a homogenous blade, where, the, where the, the heat treatment has gone through every part of the blade. So it's like a spring now. And, and if you stress that too much in one direction, it can crack or break. And then there's laminated blades. And typically, the Japanese blades are laminated. You've got a mild steel or a softer steel paired or married with a high carbon tool steel core. And, and they're actually able to, you know, through physical force, bend it back to straightness. And the mild steel, even though the carbon steel is springing, it wants to go back, the mild steel holds it in place. So if you're using the kind where it's homogeneous, just hard, yep. you keep that from yep. Although, Especially among the yeah. When they when they straighten when anybody straightens you know like the like the saw makers this was the this was the challenge that all the old hand forged saw makers face because they were really thin wide blades and they have to be both untwisted and straight so after they would you know, quench the blade and temper it then they had a special tool uh, which is like a I don't know what they used a long time ago but what they use currently is a hammer that has a special carbide tip in it and it's at a at a very obtuse V angle. And they, they literally, they, on, a, on a hard anvil, they literally ding the surface and they make divots in the hardened steel. And it pushes the steel away from, I have a picture of it in my book. I've got a book, Bladesmithing with Murray Carter, on my table if you want to order a copy. We've only got one left, but there's an illustration in there where they, they ding the surface and it moves the steel away and it bends the steel the opposite way. So if you have a blade that's got a cup in it like this, you put that on the anvil and you hammer it, and, and by the direction you hammer it, you can, you can unfold it this way or this way or just straight. It depends on the angle of, 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 of that, uh, that little chip. But you put a series of, of dings in it, and it forces the steel the opposite way, and, but then you've got to polish out the dings. And so you've got so you to you bend it a little bit further than what you want, so when you polish it out, you can't see it, but the steel has still been displaced to the sides. Does that make sense? Yeah, if I had a whiteboard here, I could draw a dagger. You sometimes have to compromise a little bit and not harden it quite so much, so you are able to move the metal a little better. That well, way. that would come. That wouldn't come in the hardening step. That would come in the tempering step. There's most of you probably know this, but there's three critical metallurgical uh, heat treating steps to making a blade hard. First of all, you, you you process it and get it into the shape it needs to be, and then you do what's called annealing, which is a stress relieving metallurgical process where you heat the thing up basically to red or orange hot and then you let it cool slowly and that relieves stresses in the steel. Then they'd stamp their name on it, make sure it's just the way they want it and the next step is going to be quenching where they heat it up to the same temperature again, maybe a little bit hotter and then, they, then they're going to rapidly insert it into you know, their oil or their water or, or in some cases some blades are air, air hardened so they heat it up to the right temperature and then they put it in front of a moving fan and it blows the heat off. Some stainless steels are like that. That's quenching, and then the last is tempering, where they heat it up now a third time, but to a very modest heat, 
they're not going to heat it up to the point where the thing starts glowing red again. There's, it's a very low temperature, maybe 400, 450 degrees Fahrenheit. And, uh, and then that'll draw hardness out of the steel and thereby make the steel tough and flexible. The higher of a tempering temperature you temper a blade at, the more you compromise the rock wheel hardness, but the tougher and springier it'll be. And in fact, a steel that's been tempered like on your, on your truck, your leaf springs, something that, you know, steel that, that springs back and forth every single day, okay, it has like a, a most blades have a rock wheel hardness of about between 57 and 60, and one of those springs has a rock wheel hardness of about 50, maybe 52. So, so when you get a blade that's so springy, it now will no longer hold a really good edge because it's so soft. But it's really good at springing, but not very good at cutting. So, uh, you know, that's some of, those, you know, some of those swords that they show you. Look, this Chinese sword where they can bend it in half or whatever. Well, fine and dandy, it's, it's, it's like a spring, but you, you can never put a razor sharp edge on something like that. Now, m mind you, a sword usually cuts through centrifugal force and, you know, they cleave in half, hack. So, you know, it works just fine in that application, but you could never technically get a sword that springs like that razor sharp. You just couldn't. Okay? Yes, sir. You talked about the Hitachi white steel number one being the top of the line for mm -hmm. the Japanese blades. Mm -hmm. At what point did that become true? Uh, probably back in the 60s or 70s. Yeah, that, that's, I'm, 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 yeah, it would have been the Swedish steel, and before that, you know, would have been, you know, small micro batches of steel, you know, made by different bladesmiths around Japan. Yeah. You know, so much, so much of Japan changed, you know, when it, you know, after World War II, and it got bombed severely, and different industries were destroyed, and they, in many cases, they had to start from scratch, so. Not to say they didn't have a coming. <laughs> causing that Mac knives like we get I sell a lot of those and they're at a 10 or 12 degree angle depending on the knife and none of them are chipping mm -hmm. but it's the last few years the, the shun are chipping hmm. <coughs> now I'm not sure maybe they, maybe they start grinding them thinner higher rock well but you know th that's a good sign if a blade will chip out then it, you got good metallurgy it, unless when it chips out and you look at it in the strong source of light or with a magnifying glass, if it looks really granular, if the steel grain looks really granular, like grains of sand, and it's, and it's really obvious, then, then somewhere in the process of making the knife, it was over, the steel was overheated. But if when a blade chips out, and you look at the steel where it chipped out, and if it looks just like a flat, matte gray, maybe you can see little tiny little sparkly little, looks like little diamonds in there, but just tiny ones, but mostly it just looks like flat gray, then that's a really good steel. You got you got a really good blade there. You just got to regrind it back again, get the chips out, and you got the kind of metallurgy you want for high performance cutlery. What are the times that you'd want to use Hitachi blue instead of Hitachi white? Okay, well, I I have discontinued using Hitachi blue steel, but I'll, but fundamentally the difference between Hitachi blue steel and white steel white steel was was uh, engineered to mimic the finer qualities of the Japanese swords. And when I say engineered, it's, it's, it's uh, engineered only from the perspective that it's carbon, iron, and engineered to have no impurities in it. When it where they labor when they smelt their white steel is to keep phosphorus and sulfur out of it. If you compare just on a chart the difference between O1 tool, tool steel and Hitachi white steel, besides the difference in carbon, the Hitachi white steel has upwards of 0.4% of a carbon more than Hitachi, uh, uh, O1, which has about 1%, so 1% versus 1.4. Besides that, the glaring difference is, is that the uh, impurity level of O1 tool steel might be, say, like 0.3% sulfur, or 0.03% sulfur. And the Hitachi is 0.003. It's 10 times more stringent. And the same thing with phosphorus. Both of these are considered impurities when you're trying to make a blade out of steel. Sulfur acts to Sul sulfur has the, re the resultant uh, influence of softening steel when you add it to steel. So when they're turning nuts and bolts 
they add sulfur to the steel to make it machine easier. But you don't want that in a blade. You're not looking for soft in a blade. So, so it's, the, it's the attention to cleanliness and impurities is what really makes the Hitachi white steel stand out. The blue steel is the white steel as a base to which, in the interest of, of uh, ease of manufacture for the bladesmiths and edge retention, they add, I think, molybdenum, chromium, tungsten, and something else. I, it's, so it without my charts here in front of me. It doesn't corrode as much. Uh, yeah, but it's pretty much the same. Nice looking BMW motorcycle drove by. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, uh, yeah, the, the blue steel, you know, here, the interesting thing about blue steel since you brought it up, is anyone ever heard of like a company called the Japanese Woodworker or Corin Knife yes. Company in, 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 in New York or uh, the Hita Tool Company in California? Okay, these are kind of the premier yeah, importers of Japanese tools and knives into North America. And almost always in the catalogs, when you read about the tool being made out of blue super steel, you hear, blue super steel, Japan's best steel, made of the finest this and that, you know, they're always talking up a blue steel. The truth of the matter is, and we wrote an article, didn't I write an article on that? It was going to go in Blade Magazine, they said? Yeah, the truth of the matter is, is that white steel is the best steel, but the problem is you need a really experienced, dedicated, old-timer bladesmith to bring out the full potential of white steel. In its, in its superiority, it has some idiosyncrasies that make it difficult to work with. The forging, the annealing, the quenching, the tempering, the grinding. And uh, blue super steel, conversely, is an easier steel for you know, apprentices or novices or whatever to work with. So let's say, let's say you, want to imp you want to import 100 sets of Japanese chisels into some country. You gotta place the order with the, guy who, with the company who can do it. Well, this company, if you place the order in white steel, they say, oh, Mr. Tanaka, no, he's busy, he's backlogged for three years, and he's the only man who could who make that out of the white steel. But we got these eight apprentices over here, and they could easily do it out of blue steel. Well, let's go with blue steel, you know, because we could get it on time and so on. And, you know, blue steel makes a decent blade. And, you know, the only trick in, in are we out of time? Who's the What's that? Okay. The only trick in, in making knives out of blue steel is not to fundamentally mess up the process. Don't overheat it too badly, you know, preferably not at all, but it's, it's easy to maintain the initial integrity that blue steel has to the finished product versus trying to wring out all the potential of white steel. I compare it like this. White steel is to the bladesmith what a white canvas is to the artist. And it's all up to the artist to paint that masterpiece. Blue steel is already up here because it's an engineered steel. As long as you don't fundamentally mess it up, you're going to end up with a product that's up here. White steel starts here, but its potential is way up there. But there's only a handful. And that's why back last December I made this big announcement that at Carter Cutlery, after making 17,000 knives, in the interest of mastering white steel, so that one day, when I'm old and crepit, someone say, Murray Carter mastered white steel. So I could be up there in the ranks. So I now am only making knives in white steel. Because, because every, every honest bladesmith in Japan will say, yeah, white, you know, no doubt, white steel, you can make knives that'll outcut, outperform, have better edge retention than, than blue super steel knives or any other steel out there. But who could do it? <laughs> you know. You know, the, all the youngsters, they look at the old guys and say, wow, they're from a different generation. You know, they, they work into the wee hours of night and they're all, all, I know some guys, you know, from Forge Welding, they have no original skin on their forearms. Oh this is all scar tissue. Just from years and years and years of, of Forge Welding billets. And, and just, you know, just, it's just, it, just one little tiny little, you know, burn here, one spark there, no big deal. And, you know, nothing that was so, it's not like, you know, catching your forearms on fire, you know. Nothing so big that they felt like they always needed leather gauntlets, but over you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, Mr. Shiraki, who I consider the Jap Japan's best bladesmith, and again, if you go on YouTube and look up Carter Cutlery Japan Tour, J Japan's best bladesmith. In fact, we have two segments on him up there. You know, he's, uh, how old is Mr. Shiraki? He's like 65 or something. He's been forging knives since he was 15. That's 50 years. 
And at his peak, he would forge weld and forge out 250 knives a day. Now that's, now that's, that's, that's laminating the carbon steel to the mild steel and forging it into the shape and getting it to the process of annealing it. So that's not completing the knife. That's, you know, that's just a rough forging. But still, that's going bump, 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 into his fire. Bump, 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 you know, like day after day after day like that. Yeah. Real quick, what, what about cryogenic processes with Hitachi White? Do you, have you not necessary. Yeah. I've never experimented with it, but you're talking about sub-zero quenches? Yes. Yeah, the uh, Hitachi white steel, in its simplicity, doesn't require those sub-zero temperatures to have the full uh, metallurgical conversion from whatever that is, you know, perlite or whatever, to austenite to martensite. Yeah. Okay. Quick question: Where is your table at? Uh, we there's as you enter into the showroom. I'm glad you asked. As you enter into the showroom from the entrance, we're like the first table on the right. There's a there's a glass showcase there with a lot of things like a lot of prizes, the door prizes. We're right there, PO1 and PO2. And at my table, of course, we have a great selection of, of uh, hand-forged kitchen knives that I made. We have a great selection of neck knives that I made all sort of the same laminated steel. We have my book, Bladesmithing with Murray Carter, which was published last October. We have, we have two parts one and parts two of kitchen cut.